A very good afternoon aspirants. Welcome to an another video in the Shankar's summary compilation series. In this video, we are going to see about quality part 2 in which we will be covering important current affairs topics from November 2023 to March 2024. Displayed here are the list of topics that we have chosen for this particular video. Just check it from the first to the end. I have also attached the uh, links of the previous videos in the description below. Do check it out. So without much delay, let us get into the video. Now look at this question about simultaneous election. See, simultaneous election were frequently in use due to the constitution of a high level committee on one nation, one election headed by former president Ram Nath Govind. Currently, the committee has submitted its report. In this line, first let us revise about simultaneous election. Then we shall try to answer this particular question. See, the concept of one nation, one election envisions to conduct simultaneous polls across the country. This means that the elections for Lok Sabha, all state assemblies and panchayats will be conducted at the same time. Remember the practice of simultaneous election is not a new phenomenon for India. The first general election to the Lok Sabha and all legislative assemblies were held simultaneously in 1951 to 52. The practice continued in the subsequent general elections held in the years 1957, 1962 and 1960. In 1970, the Lok Sabha was itself dissolved prematurely and fresh elections were held in 1971. This was the beginning of the end of simultaneous elections in India. As of 2019, only four states had their assembly election along with the Lok Sabha. This means we now have at least two rounds of assembly general elections every year. So, the factors responsible for disruption of simultaneous elections include dismissal of elections, defections, hung elections, by-elections due to death and etc. So, the key recommendations of high-level committee will be around resolving these issues, right? Now, let us see about some of the key recommendations of the high-level committee. See, totally 18 amendments to the constitution and other statutes have been suggested. In the first step, simultaneous elections will be held to Lok Sabha and state assemblies. To achieve synchronization at the first step, the government should take a one-time step where they pick a specific day after a Lok Sabha election. After this date, the terms of all state assemblies that have elections will end along with parliament's term. To effect these changes, the panel has suggested amendment to Article 83, which is about the duration of houses of parliament, and Article 172, which is about duration of state legislature of the constitution. For this, no ratification by the states will be required for the constitutional amendment. In the second step, election to municipalities and the panchayats will be synchronized with elections to Lok Sabha and state assemblies. This will be done in such a way that local body elections are held within 100 days of the elections to Lok Sabha and state assemblies. This will require ratification by not less than one half of the states. Secondly, the committee recommended insertion of Article 324A. It states that Parliament may make a law to ensure that elections to municipalities and panchayats be held together with general elections. Thirdly, to make single electoral roll and electoral photo identity cards for use in elections to all the three tiers of government, the committee recommended that Article 325 of the Constitution must be amended. Then only Election Commission of India can prepare a single electoral roll and election ID in consultation with the state election commissions. These amendments will require ratification by not less than one half of the states. Then in the event of a hung house, no confidence motion or any such event Fresh elections should be held to constitute the new Lok Sabha or state assemblies for the unexpired term of the House. Finally, the committee rejected the concept of constructive vote of no confidence, which is the model in Germany. See, in this model, to bring a no confidence motion against a government, a positive vote of confidence in an alternative leader or government is required. The committee noted that making a motion of no confidence by the members of the parliament is not only their right but also their responsibility. So the committee did not like to dilute this feature of the Indian parliamentary system. So these are all some of the key recommendations of the HLC. The committee also noted that holding simultaneous elections will save money, reduce burden on administrative setup and 
security forces, ensure timely implementation of common policies and ensure that the administrative machinery is engaged in development activities rather than electioneering. So now coming back to the question, here the correct answer for the question is option C3 only. South Africa, Sweden and UK alone conduct simultaneous elections. India is planning to conduct simultaneous elections. Hope it will happen in the future. So the correct answer for this question is option C. Take a look at this question about RPA Act. Here the only suspicious or extreme statement in the question is statement 2. Does RPA Act provide for allocation of seats exclusively to the House of People and Legislative Assembly of States? See the answer to this question is no. The RPA Act also provides for allocation of seats in the legislative councils of state as well. So the correct answer for this particular question is option C, 3 only because statement 2 is incorrect here. See to answer questions like these you have to know about particular provision or act exactly. So let us revise about the RPA Act. It is very important topic in the perspective of both prelims and mains. Firstly know that article 324 to 329 of part 15 of the Indian constitution provides for the country's electoral system. The constitution confers upon the parliament the power to enact laws for all matters connected with the election to the parliament and the state legislature. Consequently, the government introduced the first RPA Act in 1950 in order to regulate elections in the country. Remember, the Act consists of four schedules mentioned here in the image. As you can see in this image, it provides for the conduct of election of the houses of parliament and to the houses or house of the legislature of each state. Then it provides details about the structure of administrative machinery for the conduct of election. Then it provides for the qualification and disqualification for membership of those houses. Finally, it provides for the corrupt practices and other offences at or in connection with such elections and the decision of doubts and debates arising out of or in connection with such elections. So these are some salient features of the act. Now let us see some of the important provisions of the act one by one. See the first important provision is that the power to make rules under the act is conferred to the central government which can exercise this power in consultation with the election commission of India. Secondly, the civil courts have been barred to question the legality of any actions of the ERO regarding revision of electoral rules. Here electoral registration officer or the ERO is responsible for the preparation of the electoral role for each constituency that is for both the parliament and assembly election. So an appeal against the order of ERO during the updation of the electoral role lies with district magistrate. Thirdly, in 2010, voting rights were extended to citizens of India living abroad. That is, even NRIs can vote in our election. Fourthly, one person can vote at one constituency only and only for one time in a particular election. If a person is confined in a prison, whether under a sentence of imprisonment or transportation, then he is not eligible for voting. However, in the case of preventive custody, he can vote. This means that person under trials and convicts cannot vote in election. Very important point. However, the act allows those serving sentences less than two years to contest elections from prison. Apart from this, section 8 clause 3 of the act states that if an MP or MLA is convicted for any other crime and is sent to jail for two years or more, he or she will be disqualified for six years from the time of release. Even if a person is on bail after the conviction and his appeal is pending for disposal, he is disqualified from contesting an election. So these two are very important facts that you have to remember about RPA Act. Even we have previous questions regarding it. Fifthly, every association or body in order to become a political party must be registered with the ECI whose decision regarding registration will be final. Change in name an address of a registered political party must be communicated to the Election Commission of India. However, the Election Commission of India cannot de-recognize a party. Finally, after getting elected, MPs are required to file a declaration of assets and liabilities with the Speaker of Lok Sabha and the Chairman of Rajya Sabha. These declarations have to be made by MPs within 90 days of taking their seat in Parliament. So these are all very important provisions that you have to remember about RPA Act. So here the correct answer for this particular question is option C, 3 only. Only three statements are correct. The second statement given here is incorrect. Look at this question about National Council for Transgender Persons, NCTP. This question has been asked because few days back a trans person activist named Kalki Subramaniam 
has been nominated as the representative to the council from the southern region. That is why NCTP was in news. So let us revise about the council first and then we shall try to answer this particular question. See, the National Council for Transgender Person is created to mainstream the transgender community's concern, focusing on livelihood issues as well as to raise awareness about the trans community. It is actually established to monitor and evaluate the implementation of the provisions of the Transgender Persons Protection of Rights Act 2019. So what about the composition of the council? See, its chairperson will be the union minister of the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment. The council will consist of representatives from five state or union territory, one from the north, south, east, west and northeastern region on a rotational basis. Then five members of the transgender community, one each from north, south, east, west and northeastern region. Then representatives from 10 central ministries and departments. The tenure of the community members will be three years. So the functions of the council are displayed here. You can just go through it. Now let us see some of the important provisions of the Transgender Persons Act 2019. Firstly, it established the National Council for Transgender Person, which we saw just now. Secondly, it provides a definition of a transgender person. The Act defines a transgender person as one whose gender does not match the gender assigned at birth. Thirdly, the Act states that a transgender person shall have the right to self-perceived gender identity. A certificate of identity can be obtained at the district magistrate's office and a revised certificate is to be obtained if sex is changed. Fourthly, the Act has a provision that provides transgender the right of residence with parents and immediate family members. Fifthly, the Act prohibits discrimination against a transgender person in various sectors like education, employment and healthcare and etc. Lastly, the Act states that the offences against transgender person will attract imprisonment between 5 months and 2 years in addition to a fine. So these are all some of the important facts that you have to remember about Transgender Persons Act of 2019. With this basic knowledge, now let us try to answer this particular question. Here both the statements are correct. NCTP is actually a statutory body and the chairman of the council is the Union Minister for Social Justice and Empowerment. So the correct answer for this particular question is option C, both 1 and 2. Look at this question. These are all some of the bodies that were frequently in news. That is why I have chosen this particular question. Okay, look at this first body. It is CBI. Is CBI a statutory body? Absolutely not. It is a non-constitutional body that derives its power from the Delhi Special Police Enactment Act of 1946. Currently, the Bureau is functioning under the Department of Personal, which is under the Ministry of Personal, Pension and Public Grievances. Remember, CBI is the premier investigating police agency in India. It provides assistance to the Central Vigilance Commission and Lokpal. It is also the nodal police agency in India which coordinates investigation on behalf of Interpol member countries. So the first statement is obviously incorrect. So you can eliminate option A and option B. So if you know whether the fifth body, that is the Central Adoption Resource Authority, is a statutory body or not, you can directly arrive at the answer. Is Central Adoption Resource Authority, CARA, is a statutory body? Yes, obviously it is a statutory body of Ministry of Women and Child Development. It functions as the nodal body for adoption of Indian children and is mandated to monitor and regulate in-country and inter-country adoptions. Remember this, in-country and inter-country adoptions. CARA has been constituted under the Section 69 of the Juvenile Justice Care and Protection of Children Act 2015 by the Ministry of Women and Child Development, as I said earlier. So it is a statutory body. So what is the correct answer for the question? The correct answer for the question is option D, 2, 3, 4 and 5 only. So now let's quickly go through the CCI and other bodies as well. So as you all know, CCI is a statutory authority established under the Competition Act 2002. It seeks to prevent activities that have an appreciable adverse effect on competition in India. Then the NIA, it is a statutory body as well. It was constituted under the National Investigation Agency Act of 2008. It is the Central Counter-Terrorism Law Enforcement Agency 
and it has the power to investigate any offenses that jeopardize India's integrity, security or sovereignty. Then coming to NCB, NCB is Narcotics Control Bureau. It is Apex Coordinating Agency responsible for fighting drug trafficking and the abuse of illegal substances. It functions under the Ministry of Home Affairs. Remember, officers from Indian Revenue Service, Indian Police Service and Paramilitary Force work under NCB. It was constituted by the Government of India in 1986 under the Narcotics, Drugs and Psychiatric Substances Act 1985. Then we saw about CARA as well. So the correct answer for this particular question is option D, 2, 3, 4 and 5 only. Apart from this, each body has their own composition, their own tenure and each will be appointed by a particular authority. If you have to know that, you have to go back to our newspaper analysis and see our video. But to answer this particular question, this much clarity is very enough. Now moving on, look at this question about Pusni judge. This question has been asked due to a letter written by Prashant Bhushan who is an advocate in the Supreme Court to the Supreme Court Registry. He alleged that there is an irregularity in the listing of a case in the Supreme Court. The advocate said that the pending cases should be allotted to the senior judges and the cases can be listed before the Pusni or junior judges only if the senior judge is not available. The advocate said that these rules were arbitrarily breached in the Supreme Court. However, the Supreme Court Registry rejected this allegation. The registry said that there is no influence in the allocation of cases. Since this dispute was in news, this particular question has been asked. Now that the word Pusni is a French word which means later born or younger. So the term Pusni judge itself refers to judge who is ranked lower in seniority. It is used to refer to any judge other than the chief judge justice of the court. This term is usually used in common law countries. Here the term common law is nothing but the body of law that is created by judges through their written opinion rather than through statutes or constitution. If you could not understand what does the term mean, let me give an example. Let us take Supreme Court judgments in India. In India, the Supreme Court judges deliver their judgments through written opinions. The judgments have the power of law. This is what is known as common law. Here the law is enforced through judgments but not through statutes or constitution provisions. Okay, I hope you can get it. Common law is used interchangeably with case laws and it is based on judicial precedent. The United Kingdom and the Commonwealth countries including India are common law countries. Remember in the UK, Pusni judges are judges other than those holding distinct titles. But in India, all judges have the same judicial powers. Being the senior most judge of a court, the chief justice has an additional administrative role. So in India, there is reference to a Pusni judge only while considering the order of seniority for appointments, elevation to high courts and etc. But it does not have a bearing on the exercise of a judge's judicial power. So with this knowledge, let us try to answer this particular question. Here all the statements are correct except option D. Pusni judges have nothing to do with high profile cases. In India, this term is actually used while considering the order of seniority for appointments and elevation to high courts. And it does not affect a judge's judicial power. So the correct answer here is option D since the question asked for incorrect statement. Now look at this question. See, during the month of January this year, Balkis Banu case was frequently in news. While dealing with a plea by the convicts in the Balkis Banu case, the Supreme Court said that the rule of law is very essential for the existence and flourishing of personal liberty or any other fundamental right. That is why this particular question is asked. Now look at this question. To answer this question, you should first know about rule of law and how it is different from rule by law. Let's see about rule of law first. See, the concept of rule of law was first propounded by a British jurist named A.V. Dicey. Don't forget this name. He defines three principles that governs the rule of law. Firstly, absence of arbitrary power. That is, no man can be punished except for a breach of law. Secondly, equality before law. That is, equal subjection of all citizens to the ordinary law of the land, indicating that no one is above law. Thirdly, the primacy of the right of the individual. That is, the constitution is the result of the right of the individual as defined and enforced by the court of law rather than the constitution being the source of the individual rights. So, 
so in simple words rule of law is a legal system that is governed by laws rather than by persons it imposes legal constraints to political arbitrariness and overthrows tyranny and anarchy public welfare is the dominant consideration in this particular system so the system provides safeguards for the protection of the individuals and it also gives the freedom to the judiciary to control the executive who exceed their jurisdiction on the contrary there is another concept known as the rule by law it refers to a situation where the legal system is used as a tool by those in power to maintain their authority could you understand the difference in such a system law may be used selectively to favor those in authority and legal mechanisms can be manipulated for political purposes so it lacks the emphasis on fairness justice and equal application found in the rule of law so what are all the characteristics of rule by law firstly laws may be used as instrument of control rather than as mechanism for justice secondly there will be selective enforcement of laws to target specific individual or group thirdly it offers limited protection of individual rights particularly when they conflict with the interest of those in power finally there will be a weak or absence of checks and balances on government actions for example during the colonial era in india britishers used rule by law rather than rule of law this is done to control the indian subjects other example include nazi germany putting jews in concentration camps and thereafter sent them to the gas chamber then during the apartheid regime in south africa repressive and racial discriminatory laws against the black majority were sought to be justified on the basis of enacted laws see all these are examples of rule by law so these are the major differences between rule of law and rule by law remember independent india follows rule of law in keshwan and the bharati case our supreme court ruled that the rule of law is part of the basic structure of the indian constitution but in the indian system of rule of law the constitution is not the result of the rights of the individuals in indian context the constitution is the source of individual rights remember this difference as well now coming back to the question here the first statement is correct second statement is also correct both are the characteristics of the rule of law but the third statement is incorrect it is the government that is responsible to the people and not the vice versa so the correct answer for this particular question is option b only two look at these bodies these bodies were frequently in news here you have to find how many of the bodies mentioned functions under union ministry of finance see here the first body that is financial stability board it was established in 2009 after a g20 summit it replaced the erstwhile financial stability forum its headquarters is located in basel switzerland the fsb is like a global watchdog for the financial world it monitors and makes recommendation about the global financial system and its objective are to ensure international financial stability and increase the stability of international financial markets so it does not function under union ministry of finance so obviously first will not come the body mentioned second is the central consumer protection authority it was established under the consumer protection act 2019 it works under the administrative control of ministry of consumer affairs its main function is to regulate matters relating to the violation of rights of consumers it also keeps an eye on unfair trade practices and false or misleading advertisements which are prejudicial to the interest of public and consumers and it works to promote protect and enforce the rights of consumers collectively so it does not function under union ministry of finance now the body mentioned thirdly is the pension fund regulatory and development authority in short called as pfr da so it was enacted by the pension fund regulatory and development authority act in 2013 it regulates nps subscribed by employee of government then state government and by employees of private institutions or organization and unorganized sectors remember it operates under the department of financial services which comes under the ministry of finance so this body comes under the ministry of finance and finally the financial stability and development council it is an autonomous body constituted after the recommendation of raghuram rajan committee it was actually constituted by an executive order of the union government as a non statutory apex body under the ministry of finance in 2010 so this agency keeps track of all the contributions investments and returns in a detailed and organized manner and it mainly deals with 
macro prudential and financial regularities in the entire financial sector of india this body also envisages to strengthen and institutionalize the mechanism of maintaining financial stability financial sector development interregulatory coordination along with monitoring macro prudential regulation of the economy so fsdc actually functions under finance ministry so what is the correct answer for the question the correct answer for the question is option c 3 and 4 only Moving on, look at this question about President's role in India. Here I have displayed different types of emergencies in the table. You can go through it. Actually, I have asked this question because President's rule was frequently in use due to Article 370. Remember, the President's rule can be proclaimed under Article 356 on two grounds. One mentioned in Article 356 itself and another in Article 365. As per Article 355, The clause imposes a duty on the center to ensure that the government of every state is carried on in accordance with the provisions of the constitution. It is this duty in the performance of which the center takes over the government of a state under article 356 in case of failure of constitutional machinery in state. See this is popularly known as president's rule and it is also known as state's emergency or constitutional emergency. On the other hand as per article 365 president's rule can be imposed if any state fails to comply with all decisions given by the union on matters it is empowered to. So this means that the first statement is correct but the second statement is actually incorrect the 38th amendment act of 1975 made the satisfaction of the president in invoking article 356 final and conclusive and it cannot be challenged in any court on any ground but this provision was subsequently deleted by the 44th amendment act of 1978 and it implied that the satisfaction of the president is not beyond judicial review in bomai case of 1994 the supreme court said that imposition of president's rule in a state under article 356 is subject to judicial review so here the second statement is incorrect so the correct answer for the question is option a one only take a look at this question this question is talking about the difference between lokpal and lokayukta before answering the question remember both lokpal and lokayukta were established under the lokpal and lokayukta act 2013 so both are statutory bodies both lokpal and lokayukta are mandated to inquire into allegations of corruption charges that are made against public functionaries Here the term public functionaries mean that the person who are falling within the ambit of the Lokpal and Lok Ayukta Act 2013. Know that Lokpal was established at the union level. It inquires into allegations of corruption charges that are made against former and current central government executives and employees. They include the prime minister, union government, minister, members of parliament, group a b c and d officers and other officials of the union government apart from this functionaries of any board corporation society trust or autonomous body that was established by an act of parliament or wholly or partly funded by the union or state government they are also covered under the ambit of lokpal in addition to this lokpal also covers any society or trust or body that receives foreign contribution above rupees 10 lakh now coming to lokayukta See, these were established at state level to inquire into allegations of corruption charges that are made against former and current state government executives and employees. The jurisdiction of Lokayukta is not the same in all states. In some states, apart from state government officials, the CM and state ministers were also brought under the ambit of Lokayukta. Whereas in some states, the CM and ministers were excluded from the ambit of Lokayukta. Apart from this, Lokpal consists of a minimum of eight members. and a chairman whereas lok ayukta consists of members differing from place to place that is state to state so here the first statement is interchangeably used lokpal is formed at national level and lok ayukta is formed at state level the second statement is also incorrect only lokpal has the power to conduct trials for all members of parliament and central government employees and not the lok ayukta and the third statement given here is correct So the correct answer for this particular question is option A one only. Apart from this, the qualification of the members are displayed here. You can just pause the video and go through it. Moving on, look at this question about parliamentary government. Some of its speeches are given, and you have to find how many of them is or are correct. See to answer this 
question you should know about the types of executives around the world as you can see in this image it can be classified into two sub classification one in which the system is based on the principles of collective leadership and the second one is the system based on individual leadership the collective leadership can be further classified into two types one is parliamentary and another is semi presidential system in the parliamentary head of the government is usually known as prime minister he is the leader of the majority party in legislature and he is accountable to the legislature whereas the head of the state may be a monarch and if the head of the state is monarch we will call it as constitutional monarchy a very good example for this type of constitutional monarchy is uk and when the head of the state is president that is a elected representative then we call it as parliamentary republic india is a parliamentary republic now the another type is semi presidential type see this system is actually a republican system of governance that combines the elements of presidential democracy with parliamentary democracy that is it includes a popularly elected head of state and a legislature selected head of government actually they both run the day to day affairs of the state but often the president has more powers than the prime minister a very good example for this system of government is sri lanka now moving on to the individual leadership here the only subtype is presidential form of government say in presidential form of government the head of the state and the head of the government both is the president he is usually directly elected by the people and he is not accountable to the legislature of that particular government a very good example for this type of presidential form of government is usa so with this basic knowledge now let us try to answer this particular question here the first statement says president is both the head of the state and the head of government this statement is absolutely wrong it is the feature of presidential form of government and not the parliamentary government okay so this statement is actually wrong now look at the second statement double membership this statement is actually correct the ministers are actually members of both the legislature and the executive third statement says dissolution of the lower house this statement is also correct and finally it says collective responsibility actually this is the bedrock principle of parliamentary government the ministers are collectively responsible to the parliament and they actually act as a team they swim or sink together so the correct answer for this particular question is option c3 only because only 2 3 and 4 is correct first is incorrect Look at this question about police custody and judicial custody it is a very important question firstly understand that arrest is different from custody arrest means putting restriction on the movement of a person it can be done by an investigation officer if he or she is satisfied that the arrest is necessary to prevent the person from doing mischiefs generally arrest is followed by custody but it is not necessary that every case of custody must be preceded by arrest here the word custody means apprehending someone for protective care every person who is arrested and detained in custody shall be produced before the nearest magistrate within a period of 24 hours of arrest if they have not been arrested without a warrant Now the magistrate may further remand the person to custody of police for a period of maximum 15 days after the lapse of the 15 days or the police custody period granted by the magistrate the person may be further remanded to judicial custody know that judicial custody means that the person is detained under the preview of the judicial magistrate in such situations the accused is lodged in central or state prison the judicial custody can extend up to 60 or 90 days as a whole depending upon the maximum punishment prescribed for the offense also remember in the police custody the investigating authority can interrogate a person while in judicial custody there will be no interrogation unless the officials get permission of the court for questioning then in uh, police custody the person has various rights like right to legal counsel right to be informed of the grounds and etc and it is the responsibility of the police to ensure all these rights but in the case of judicial custody the accused will be in jail so the prison manual will govern the routine conduct of the person then in judicial custody the person can apply for a bail as per chapter 33 of the CRPC and remember the under trial person cannot remain in judicial custody beyond half of the time period of his or her prescribed maximum punishment so the correct answer for the question is option C because only option C is correct regarding judicial and police custody in India to answer this question you should know about the fifth schedule of Indian constitution see part 10 of the Indian constitution entails the provisions related to scheduled and tribal areas with articles 244 to 244a 
Here the president is empowered to declare an area as scheduled area under fifth schedule. With the consultation of the governor of the state, the president can alter, add, diminish the boundary of a scheduled area. And the governor of the state has to report annually to the president over the management of such areas. On the other hand, the center can give directions to the state regarding the administration of such areas. So what are the criteria to declare such scheduled areas firstly prominent number of tribal population that is when tribal people are in majority in an area secondly compactness and reasonable size of the area a viable administrative entity like district block or taluk and economic backwardness of the region as compared to the neighboring areas so these are all the criteria to declare a region as a scheduled area. So here the correct answer for the question is option A because social and political backwardness of the area is not a criteria to declare an area as scheduled areas. Okay. So here the correct answer is option A. I have displayed here the difference between the fifth schedule and the sixth schedule. You can pause the video and go through it. Moving on, look at this question about pardoning power. Here there is a comparison between the pardoning power of president and governor. See here the first option says under the Indian constitution the pardoning power of the president and governor are one and the same. This statement is actually incorrect because the president can pardon sentences inflicted by court martial while the governor cannot. So actually the pardoning power of president and governor are not one and the same. Here the second statement says the only authority for pardoning a sentence of death is the president. Actually this option is correct. Governor cannot pardon the death sentence even if a state law calls for the death penalty. However, the governor has the authority to suspend, remit or commit a death sentence. Third statement says as regards suspension, remission, the governor does not have concurrent jurisdiction with the president. So the third option is incorrect. So the correct answer for this particular question is option B. I have displayed here some of the difference between the pardoning power of president and governor. Just go through it. So the correct answer for this particular question is option B. Look at this question about FCRA. See recently the Union Home Ministry extended the validity of the FCRA registration of non-governmental organization that is NGOs and associations till June 30 of this year. See this arrangement has been made since the applications received could not be processed within the stipulated time frame. This was in news and consequently this question has been asked. See to answer this particular question you have to have a clear idea about what is FCRA and what are the provisions of it. Let us go through it one by one. Know that FCRA was enacted during the emergency in 1976 when there were apprehensions that Foreign powers were interfering in India's affairs by pumping money into the country through independent organizations. So the law sought to regulate foreign donations to individuals and associations so that they function in a manner consistent with the value of a sovereign democratic republic. Okay. Remember this act was subsequently amended or we can say that an amended FCRA was enacted in 2010 to consolidate the law on utilization of foreign funds and to prohibit their use for any activities detrimental to national interest. The law was again amended in 2020 and it gave the government tighter control and scrutiny over the recipient and utilization of foreign funds by NGOs. Hope you got what is this FCRA. And also remember FCRA is regulated by the Union Ministry of Home Affairs. Now let us quickly go through the criteria. See the FCRA requires every person or NGO seeking to receive foreign donation to be registered under the act. It should open a bank account for the recipient of the foreign funds in State Bank of India, particularly in Delhi. Then it should utilize those funds only for the purpose for which they have been received and are stipulated in the act. So this means that first two statements are incorrect and the third statement is correct. Remember FCRA registrations are granted to individuals or associations that have defined cultural, economic, educational, religious and social programs. Apart from this there are some exceptions. See under the act the applicant should not be fictitious and should not have been prosecuted or convicted for indulging in activities aimed at conversion through inducement of force either directly or indirectly from one religious faith to another. The applicant should also not have been prosecuted for or convicted of creating communal tension or harmony 
also they should not be engaged or likely to be engaged in the propagation of sedition also the act prohibits the receipt of foreign funds by candidates for elections journalists or newspaper and media broadcast companies judges and government servants members of legislature and political parties or their office bearers and organization of political nature talking about the validity of fcra registration say it is valid for 5 years and ngos are expected to apply for renewal within 6 months of the date of expiry of registration the government can also cancel the fcra registration of any ngo if it finds that the ngo is in violation of the act or if it has not engaged in any reasonable activities in its chosen field for the benefit of society for two consecutive years or if it has become defunct once the registration of an ngo is cancelled it is not eligible for registration for three years so here the correct answer for the particular question is option d3 only look at this question about ucc recently uttarakhand became first state to clear uniform civil code bill Now although Goa is governed by a UCC that is Portuguese Civil Code the assembly did not pass any law the code was retained after its celebration in 1961 so technically Uttarakhand is the first state to clear UCC bill in India so what does this term UCC or the Uniform Civil Code mean see it is nothing but a code which encompasses a single personal law for all citizens irrespective of religion sex gender and sexual orientation as simple as that the UCC called for the formulation of one law for india regarding civil cases and it envisions a single law that is applicable to all religious communities in matters like marriage divorce inheritance adoption and etc currently not only muslims but also hindus jains buddhist sikhs parsis and jews are governed by their own personal laws personal laws are determined based on religious identity also remember the ucc is mentioned in article 44 of indian constitution constitution which is part of the dpsp so it cannot be legally enforceable but in some cases supreme court has mentioned about ucc let us go through them one by one firstly in the shahbano beham versus mohammad ahmed khan this case was held in 1985 the supreme court upheld the right of a muslim woman to claim maintenance from her husband under section 125 of the criminal procedure code even after the expiry of the idat period and the court observed that a ucc would help in removing contradictions based on ideologies then secondly in sarla mudkal versus union of india this case happened in 1995 here the supreme court held that a hindu husband cannot convert to islam and marry another woman without dissolving his first marriage it also stated that a ucc would prevent such fraudulent conversions and bigamous marriages apart from this the saira banu versus union of india 2017 the supreme court declared that the practice of triple talaq as unconstitutional and violative of the dignity and equality of muslim women it also recommended that the parliament should enact a law to regulate muslim marriages and divorces so here the correct answer for the question is option d3 only because any member of parliament can reduce a bill to implement ucc and both state and central government are empowered to enact personal laws since it is not legally enforceable fourth statement is incorrect so the correct answer here is option d 31 d i hope this video helped you in revising both the static and current affairs part of the polity so if you like the video hit like do comment and don't forget to subscribe to shankar ias academy youtube channel again i have mentioned the previous videos links in the description you can just go through it